According to the World Health Organization, tobacco is the single greatest preventable cause of death in the world today, being a risk factor for six of the eight leading causes of death. It is estimated that tobacco use and exposure to tobacco smoke causes 7 million deaths annually and will kill more than 8 million people annually by the year 2030 if left unchecked. Dr. Joseph Kibachio, the head of the Division of Non-Communicable Diseases at the Ministry of Health, explains the risks of tobacco use. That is where I would want to start when talking about tobacco because there has been a narrative that has been spread far more by the tobacco industry that um, the only link or the only problem with tobacco is cancer, which is not a, a, a truth. Tobacco actually is also a risk factor for diabetes. It's also a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. It's also a risk factor for chronic pulmonary diseases. So it's a risk factor for many, many diseases, including cancer. But the one that glary, uh, glares out as uh, the direct link, for cancer there is actually a direct link between tobacco and cancer. The others usually are an indirect link that, okay, this guy is a smoker, so he has a problem with his uh, blood vessels, and so he and he's also diabetic, so he developed a problem with his legs and he had an amputation. The Global Adult Tobacco Survey of 2014 shows that 2.5 million Kenyans, amounting to 11.6% of all adults, currently use tobacco products, while the Global Youth Tobacco Survey of 2013 found that 9.9% .9 of Kenyan youth aged between 13 to 15 years uses tobacco products. The biggest driver of this epidemic is the tobacco industry. In 1994, the attorneys general of four states in the United States filed lawsuits against the tobacco industry for reimbursement of healthcare expenditures arising from tobacco-related illnesses. As part of the settlement, the tobacco companies were required to make public millions of internal corporate documents produced during this litigation, which are now held at the Truth Tobacco Industry Documents Library, created in 2002 by the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, and Center for Knowledge Management of the United States. These documents reveal the workings of one of the largest and most influential industries around the world. This documentary presents findings from a collaborative research between the Center for Tobacco Control in Africa with the University of Denver, USA, the International Institute for Legislative Affairs and the Ministry of Health in Kenya. The goal of the Kenya project was to provide insight into tobacco industry activities in Kenya to inform implementation of tobacco control policies and had three specific objectives. One was to document the history of tobacco industry interference in the tobacco control uh, uh, policy landscape in Kenya. And two is to create awareness of the tactics to policymakers and other advocates. And three is to stimulate action against uh, tobacco industry interference, specifically increase monitoring and response to tobacco industry interference. The results will be very useful for policymakers to be alert um, of the tactics uh, that the industry is using and to protect the tobacco control uh, policies. But also, too, the results will be used to increase on surveillance, monitoring of the tobacco industry uh, behavior and tactics, and hence protect uh, their interference in the tobacco control and public health policies. And three, the results will also be used uh, to inform um, the implementation of strong tobacco control programs in Africa. And to the advocates, civil society and the media, the results of this project are very critical because then they support them, provide them with evidence to argue out and to do media advocacy on increasing awareness to the public of the um, tobacco industry tactics and their behavior, but also to support um, the governments, especially the ministries, in providing, in, in voicing the, the industry interference and, 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 and providing an avenue for dialogue on how to address, on how to um, curb industry interference. The Truth Tobacco Industry Documents Archive contains 14 million documents created by tobacco companies about their advertising, manufacturing, marketing, scientific research, and political activities. The archive was built to house and provide permanent access to tobacco industry 
internal corporate documents produced during litigation between U.S. states and the seven major tobacco industry organizations and other sources. These internal documents give a view into the workings of one of the largest and most influential industries in the United States. The archive is a portal to aid investigation about tobacco industry corporate practices that are detrimental to public health. Emma Wanyonyi, the Chief Executive Officer at the International Institute for Legislative Affairs, ILA, explains the importance of this research. I think this initiative is one good example of that because through this initiative we are able to see, to understand what the industry has been doing over the years, uh, what the industry is doing now, and if we provide this information to the public, then the public can make their own decision about uh, what needs to be done. The tobacco market in Kenya is dominated by two main actors, the British American Tobacco, Kenya, which controls about 78% of the market, and Mastermind Tobacco, Kenya, controlling about 20% with the remaining comprising imports. Evidence from the Truth Library exposes a systematic interference with the development and implementation of public health policies relating to tobacco use by both companies, some dating back to the 1970s and 1980s. Peter Odiambo, a professor of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery at the University of Nairobi and chair the Tobacco Control Board, summarizes some of the strategies that the industry has used in Kenya. And I have identified in my own analysis that they use like four Ds. Yeah? One is delay as much as possible any legislation that might come. If anything comes across to you as a country, they want to dilute it as much as possible so that it's not effective. If they still don't do that, they don't succeed, or if they succeed, they still have another D. Derange it completely. Make it look irrelevant. Now, are you saying tobacco is bad? Yes, you'll say it quickly. But they'll tell you, no, but we're providing labor. Your people are being employed. No, but we're providing tax. The government revenue is being boosted. Look at how much tax we pay. And I'll tell you, there's a big lie there. Because they'll make it look like they want to help you to help them fight contraband tobacco. And it is documented that the tobacco industry itself actually smuggles 40% of the tobacco they produce. So they make, they make it look like the other competitor is the one smuggling. The other hidden competitor is the one who is produced the contraband tobacco. KRA have actually tracked them to a point where you find something entering the market from the factory, loaded for export, goes to the border and is brought back to the country. So that the interferences can be that much, in which case therefore your third world status, continent here particularly, is challenged to an extent because your capacity to actually keep on controlling them is also still very low. So that, yes, legislation is one that they actually uh, fight. Having then deranged everything, including your psychology, that you think this guy is giving us money and you don't even know how much is being repatriated from your own soil. Having done so, they actually now come to destroy the legislation. Delay, dilute, derange and destroy. In 1993, BAT Kenya's monopoly was under threat from a new entrant, Mastermind Tobacco. BAT Kenya lobbied the government to enact laws giving BAT exclusive tobacco growing zones to prevent poaching of its farmers by Mastermind. Upon enactment of this law, during a visit to London by the then Kenyan president Daniel Moy, BAT's director of African operations, Mr. Norman Davies, sent a fax to the BAT group chief executive officer, Mr. F. Broughton, requesting that he congratulates the president for the move. The government of Kenya has passed a tobacco law which looks as though it will be very successful if properly implemented in stopping poaching and illegal out-of-season growing. The law was actually drafted by us, but the government is to be congratulated on its wise actions. This legislation was repealed years later. By 2004, 
In the midst of strong efforts from Ministry of Health to enact a comprehensive tobacco control legislation, BAT Kenya and Mastermind Tobacco Kenya put their differences aside and through a public relations company called Gina Dane Corporate Communications, organized a weekend retreat for Kenyan members of parliament at a coastal resort to lobby against the new law. This trip resulted in proposed amendments to the bill, including its renaming from Tobacco Control Bill to Tobacco Products Regulation Bill, which would have weakened its scope and objectives. Following a media expose, their plans were thwarted and their proposals did not see the light of day and the Tobacco Control Act was enacted in 2007. Emma Wanyonyi speaks on the challenges of enactment of the Act. So there are a number of ways that the industry has interfered, um, or yes, has interfered in tobacco control in Kenya. I would say one of the ways that um, that sticks out very uh, clearly is their interference in the policy and legislative process, uh, because um, uh, anyone who was there before the enactment of the Act would uh, bear witness that it took a very long time for the Act to be enacted. It took uh, almost a decade of back and forth uh, because every time the Act would come uh, to Parliament, then the industry would um, take parliamentarians for trips to the coast. And we have uh, pictures, images from the media that capture those moments. And then when the uh, members of Parliament would come back to, to the House, then somehow the bill would not see the light of day. So it took quite a bit of time to get the act passed. Dr. Kibachio adds, The process of developing the act was uh, a place which was um, riddled with tobacco industry interference. Because as our legislators were trying to you know, wrap their mind around this act, uh, a big chunk of them is taken down to Mombasa and you know, distorts their thinking around how to legislate. The industry did not take this lying down. Following the enactment in 2008, Mastermind filed a suit against the Attorney General seeking to nullify the Tobacco Control Act on grounds that it is unconstitutional, irrational and an infringement of their right to trade. This suit was dismissed in 2012 after which the Ministry of Health embarked on the development of regulations for the enforcement of the Act. However, the industry attempted to derail this process as well. Professor Odiambo recalls, as we were already putting into place our regulations, word came out that the industry was actually putting aside a hundred million Kenya shillings to take our MPs to shop in London or somewhere. It leaked a bit too fast. And so uh, people back and pedaled and didn't go very far. Having been dismissed at the High Court and Court of Appeal levels, the matter is currently before the Supreme Court, causing further unnecessary delays in the gazettement of the regulations and affecting the effective implementation of tobacco control in Kenya 10 years after the enactment of the Act. Tobacco tax and price measures are a critical strategy for tobacco control, Emma Wanyonyi explains. Tobacco taxes have been found to be... What, tobacco tax and price policies, if I, I may put them that way, have been found to be one of the most effective ways to, to, to control tobacco use uh, because uh, of the economic principle where, where when you increase tax, you expect that the demand will reduce because then the price will go up. Ms. Dorka Skiptui, head of the Tobacco Control Unit, TCU at the Ministry of Health, adds, Tax is, a, is an intervention to deter people to is intended to, one, increase the price. When you raise the tax, then you increase the price of our product. So when the price is higher, then the people who have little income do not have extra income to afford such a product, and therefore it deters them from consuming it, and eventually they are uh, saved or protected from the harmful uh, effects of this consumption of these products. When also it is expensive, children are not able to buy because... Um, Tobacco in initiation of tobacco consumption starts when people do not really understand the harmfulness of such products. So when children are not able or young people are not able to afford it, then their initiation is delayed. And by the time they are able to afford, they already know the harmfulness and most likely they will not start to use uh, using these tobacco products. 
BAT's involvement in tobacco tax policies in Kenya is captured in its own documents which show early attempts to endear itself to political powers of the time with the objective of benefiting from tax waivers. Along the Mombasa Highway in Nairobi stands a residential housing development called Imara Daima, which was set up in 1992 by BAT Kenya and was officially inaugurated three years later on the 5th of April 1995 by the then President of Kenya, Daniel Moy. This is what senior BAT staff, including its African Regional Director Mr. Norman Davis, had to say about the project in separate correspondences. The project occurs at a time when it is particularly important for BAT Kenya to be seen to be good citizens. Negotiations with government on changing the excise structure commenced and BAT Kenya are trying to get leaf-growing areas to be gazetted for their exclusive development. Failure to undertake the project would have an unfavorable effect on government and staff relations. The land is being obtained with the assistance of the Office of the President on the understanding that it was used to provide low-cost workers housing in a non-profit making project. BET Kenya has received a great deal of favorable publicity from the Imara Daima scheme and the President has made a number of speeches citing this project as an example for other companies. BAT Kenya will come out of the project with considerable favorable publicity and will finally be able to withdraw from the involvement in housing scheme of staff. Imara Daima is Swahili for strong forever and was derived from BATK's slogan at the time as seen in this company's logo. The success of this strategy is captured in a presentation by the BAT Kenya Corporate Affairs Department in November 1995, which highlights among other companies' successes as the lowering of ceiling on all duties levied on cigarettes, including excess duty reduction from 18% to 15%, increase on duty on imported cigarettes from 25% to 40%, and an increase on excess only for plain cigarettes, leaving the major brands untouched. The enactment of the Tobacco Control Act 2007 presented a new challenge for the industry as it obligates the Ministry of Finance to use tax and price policies to achieve public health goals envisioned in the legislation. Between 2012 and 2015, the excise tax structure in Kenya was reviewed in line with global best practice and WHO recommendations. The Cabinet Secretary for Treasury in his budget statement for the fiscal year 2015 to 2016 while introducing the Excise Duty Bill 2015 indicated that We are imposing excise duty to compensate for harmful effects caused by production, supply, consumption or use of goods and services which costs are not directly reflected in their prices. We are introducing a new tax based on units of quantity only. As such, the bill imposes a charge on sticks of harmful cigarettes and tobacco. I have, in addition, Mr. Speaker, converted the current hybrid tax regime for cigarettes into a specific one. Mr. Vincent Kimosop, lead consultant at the Sovereign Inside Consulting Firm and who was the CEO of ILA at the time, explains why this was a milestone for the country. So in 2012, for example, we saw the the collapse of the tax structures. So that was a major step because uh, the, the tax structures that we had, four of them, uh, the mistake that we had is that the cigarettes manufacturers would actually classify their cigarettes in terms of uh, ensuring that the premium brands falls in areas that they don't pay much. And then also the other problem with having the four uh, structures was uh, you could actually switch as a, as, as a consumer. So then the ultimate objective of reducing consumption could not be realized because the industry could manipulate the tax structure and then also the consumers could do what? Could switch, uh, which is not in tandem with the requirements on the guidelines of implementing Article 6. The Excise Duty Act that came into effect in December 2015 therefore introduced a simplified structure with a flat rate for all cigarettes, indexation to adjust for inflation as well as upward trajectory on the excise rate. The change in structure and the new rate of 2,500 shillings for every 1,000 sticks up from 1,200 shillings in effect caused a price increase of between 1% for premium brands such as Dunhill and Embassy. 37% for mid-price brands such as Sportsman, Sweet Menthol and Safari and 81% for economy brands such as Rooster, Supermatch and Rocket. It became obvious that in the short term, Mastermind products would be hit harder than its competitor, BAT. 
Mastermind were quick to react by putting up a media advert challenging the act and directly attacking tobacco control advocates Ila, accusing them of being sensational, siding with a competitor and misleading the public. Consequently, after close to a year and a half of the implementation of the act and much lobbying from Mastermind Tobacco, the Cabinet Secretary for Treasury in his budget statement for the year 2017 to 2018 proposed Mr. Speaker, there has been there has been industry concern on the current taxation of cigarettes in our country. The current single tax structure of 2,500 per mile of cigarettes has been inequitable and has adversely, uh, ad adversely affected demand for locally produced low-value cigarettes. To cushion the local cigarette manufacturers from adverse financial effects due to loss in the market, I have proposed a two-tier tax structure of 2,500 per mil for cigarettes with filters and 1,800 per mil for plain cigarettes. This tax measure will ensure equity and fairness in the tobacco industry and prevent job losses in this sector. Mastermind has always presented itself as the local company producing for the poorest segment of the population. In many instances, the industry will work with front groups, individuals and institutions with hidden links to the industry. A key front group of the industry has been the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, of which both BAT Kenya and Mastermind Tobacco are members. Dorcas Kiptui recounts. Some of them include using of front groups. Like before when we were doing the law, initially they would use a group of smokers to say that it's their right to smoke and things like that then we would have a discussion with them and actually educate them on, uh, on tobacco consumption and also the industry information the industry has. And uh, also sometimes they have used uh, groups of farmers, front groups, calling themselves uh, tobacco growers, uh, groups or uh, uh, people who, retailers of tobacco products and such like front groups and uh, also commercial groups and um, they have tried in many ways to put pressure on, on the government or to speak uh, against tobacco control using front groups. Dr. Kibachio explains frustrations about dealing with tobacco industry front groups. If we take the tobacco industry to court or when we are legislating, they will come to us not the tobacco industry but as a Kenya first association of manufacturers, as a Kenya private sector alliance. So it's not the tobacco industry directly that is engaging with us. It's these other quasi um, government or other bodies that are having tobacco industry as members. Kenya is a party to the WHO's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, whose Article 5.3 urges parties to protect their public health policies from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry. The guiding principles when engaging with the tobacco industry are that there is a fundamental and irreconcilable conflict between the tobacco industry's interests and public health policy interests. Countries, when dealing with the tobacco industry or those working to further its interests, should be accountable and transparent. Countries should require the tobacco industry and those working to further its interests to operate and act in a manner that is accountable and transparent and full. Because their products are lethal, the tobacco industry should not be granted incentives and preferential treatment to establish or run their businesses. Dr. Kibachio advises. For us as policymakers, it behoves us to protect uh, policy making from tobacco uh, interference because there is absolutely no relationship between uh, tobacco and health and as the FCTC says is a fundamental and irreconcilable difference between public health and tobacco and so there is no way we can uh, hold hands on anything whatsoever policy. Civil society can also play a role. So we've been able to do um, to create awareness uh, but then we are also trying to expose what the industry is doing so when when we see um, something happening, when we see a violation of the act by the industry, when, you see, when we see, for example, advertising um, happening, then we work, we expose what they're doing uh, to the public, but also, we also work with um, the, the uh, ministry uh, or agents that are in charge of enforcement to ensure that action is taken against the industry. 